Welcome to virology. I think this is the most fascinating subject of all, but I'm slightly biased because that's somewhat what my lab works on, and I've been working on these particular organisms, as I will call them. We can argue about that later for probably t almost 25 years now. So uh, <clears throat> if you're interested in more of the stuff that I do, um, the, let's see, my website is here, extremeviruses.org. In fact, one of my students put this together uh, about a year ago now. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you like. Um, it'll Almost everything there will be about um, how wonderful vaccines are. And um, I will probably be telling you that if you get nothing else out of this class that vaccines are wonderful, um, then I consider myself a success. So <clears throat> any questions about that or if you want to get some ideas about how to talk to pro-disease people, as I call them, um, feel free to come and ask me about that as well. We're actually going to talk about all of the viruses represented by the virions on here. Um, this is the main virus that my lab works on, the SSV virus up here. This is the model of adenovirus. This is a plant virus, CCMV, um, chlorotic mosaic virus. This is bacteriophage T4 with this wonderful background of stars. And this is a virus which is very near and dear to me because I actually discovered this virus um, in about 2000, 2001. Um, so, but <clears throat> before we move any further, let's talk a little bit more about how to find me, et cetera. And oh, we're having issues again with our communication, so let's just do this. So fun. <sighs> Why are we not talking to ourselves? <sighs> See, technology, isn't it a wonderful thing? Or not, as the case may be. Case may be. Advancing would be nice. Let's try this one instead. Still, OK, there we go. <clears throat> Eventually, I get this technology to work. Um, so <clears throat> where do you find me um, when I'm not being infected by a particular virion? Uh, my office is in SRTC, just about as far away on campus as you can get from here. Uh, my office hours are directly after class. Um, probably the easiest thing to do is to grab me right here, right outside. But if you'd like, we can head over there as well. Um, and by appointment, how do you make appointments with me? Uh, basically, send an email to my PDX email address, because I rarely will answer or look at any of the other ones. If you want to talk to my voicemail, go ahead, call it. Um, I will try and get back to you. Uh, <clears throat> those of you who have had my courses before know that I'm recording this and assuming that the recording has worked. Um, that will be posted on YouTube right after class or at least as soon as I get around to editing it and posting it online. So um, all of those are there. Um, <clears throat> if you post enough on YouTube, you get to have your own channel. So um, actually see Ken Stedman here. And then as I mentioned before, um, extreme virus prof is how you can follow me on Twitter. A um, couple people asked me about prerequisites for this course. Uh, I am going to assume that you have had molecular biology before you take this course, because as we'll talk about a little bit later, this is really mostly about the molecular biology of viruses, very little about pathogenesis. Um, so if you have not had molecular biology and you're concerned about your preparation for this course, um, please come and see me either yep, right afterwards or later. Cell biology is less critical. Um, we'll mostly be talking about intracellular compartments and a little bit about transport, uh, but much less so than the real basics of molecular biology. So um, cell biology, um, any of you taking cell biology now? few of you? OK, that should be fine. There may be a couple of things that um, you might want to overlap one way or the other. But we can talk more about that later. Um, and that's so anyone not taken molecular? OK, none of you. I scared enough of you away, I guess. OK, <clears throat> so what are we going to talk about for the next 10 weeks or so? Um, again, mostly molecular virology of the major classes of viruses. There are basically sort of two different ways of teaching a virology course. One is to talk about the different mechanisms, replication, transcription, translation, pathogenesis to some extent, um, cell assembly, et cetera, or talk about each of those given the individual virus classes. And I've tried teaching both ways. I actually prefer to do 
different classes of viruses themselves and then sort of compare and contrast them to each other. Um, but there are actually some really good textbooks and some great virology courses that go about doing this the other way, just looking at replication or transcription or translation um, and those kinds of things. Also, perfectly reasonable way to do that. Um, but again, I decided to go ahead and do this um, on a virus by virus basis. And hopefully, you'll see why that is a little bit later on. So um, three big picture kinds of viruses. Really depends on the genome that the virus has. Um, we've got viruses with DNA genomes, RNA genomes, and then viruses which kind of switch back and forth between DNA and RNA, and those are the particular retroviruses. Um, we'll talk about bacteriophage, and another reason that I actually like the textbook that we're using um, is that it talks a lot more about bacteriophage than most other textbooks do. And if you get second thing out of this course <laughs> is that um, bacteriophage and viruses of microbes are probably way more important in the general scheme of life, the universe, and everything um, than viruses which are infecting us. Um, not surprisingly, most of the research is going into viruses which are infecting us. But the vast majority of viruses on this planet really um, have nothing to do with human disease whatsoever. So I like the fact that our textbook talks about at least a little bit about some of those. Um, HIV um, is sort of the culmination or almost the culmination of the course. The real culmination is when we finally get to talk about my favorite virus, um, SSV1, and the various um, Fusello viruses that are associated with that. Um, <clears throat> one of the big, again, big pictures here, yes, we'll talk about those viruses individually, but basically for all of them, what we're going to talk about is how the virus goes about making its own genome. And just the fact that some viruses have RNA genomes means that they are clearly doing things differently because no cells have RNA genomes. So that's immediately going to be a difference between the molecular biology that I talked about ad nauseum last term um, and how viruses do things. Um, gene expression is actually pretty similar between what we've talked about in molecular biology before and uh, what happens in virus. In fact, a lot of what we know about transcriptional regulation and how transcription works in human cells has to do with the study of viruses and studying how viruses then have been <clears throat> involved in gene expression. Um, one thing that's completely unique to viruses is assembly and putting together the virus particles. And we'll talk more about this later. Um, virions, I have a whole collection up here. Pity that the lights are down. Um, of my zoo, um, different virus forms, different sizes, different shapes, et cetera. Um, and all of these are up here, and um, people can come take a look at them later. Um, when we talk about virus assembly, we'll talk more about that as well. But one of the things that really defines viruses and makes it very different from any other form of life, and again, we can argue about whether they're alive or not later, is that they do form these extracellular particles. And that extracellular particle and the assembly thereof is really, really unique to viruses. And we will talk a little bit about pathogenesis, uh, partly because, yes, there's been a lot of study on it, and people care about how viruses make people sick, particularly people sometimes um, micro making microbes sick and making the other hosts, um, which they infect, sick as well. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, how do I do evaluation? Those of you who had molecular with me will find this to be very, very familiar because it's exactly the same as I did last time. Uh, two midterms, 30% um, each, one final. Um, here's the dates for the midterms. Um, final is on the regular final day for a 9 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. Um, there'll be 50 multiple choice questions on Scantrons, and I've posted a bunch of old exams on D2Ls. Um, D2L, excuse me. Um, then <clears throat> we also have clickers. Um, for clickers, again, for those, how many of you didn't have me last term? Few of you. Okay. So um, the way I do clickers is a little different than the way some people do clickers. Um, I only give points for the correct answer, but if less than 70% of people have gotten the correct answer in the first minute, then I give you some more time to talk to your friends, neighbors, etc. cetera, um, and then we go ahead and do a second round. And usually then it gets to be above 80% of people who have the correct answer. Um, so we will do that. Um, there'll be every day, um, usually two or three clicker questions per lecture. Um, they only start counting next week. 
They're 10% of the grade. Um, you need to have a device for your clicker. Um, we, I don't let people use their cell phones for all kinds of different reasons that, again, we can talk about later. Um, if you are in desperate need of one, um, we've got some on reserve in the library. Um, you can check out for two hours, which is the length of time for the class. And if you really have issues, come and talk to me um, a little later. Uh, register on D2L, this should actually work now, as, um, as opposed to last term where I didn't manage to get it together. Um, so register your clicker number um, on D2L by the midterm. So how many of you have clickers with you today? Okay, can we do a quick survey then? Which again, will not count. Um, which of the following best describes you? You're a junior biology major, a senior biology major, post back junior, a senior non-biology major, or none of the above? So let's actually start, if they'll get this to start. Okay, yes, AA, close. Just so we get, and, and actually I, I have this information already, so I'll see if you actually agree with my information that I have, <laughs> which may or may not be correct. Uh, <clears throat> but also it gives you a bit of an idea of the distribution um, of people who are in the class. And I didn't put graduate students on here, I guess that would be none of the above as well. Or auditors would also be none of the above if they happen to have clickers with them. Anyone else got one? Clickers? Again, we just they only start counting as of next week. So Okay, so let's see what people say. We're mostly senior bio majors. Yay. Okay. And you know, a few postbacks. Um no, none of the above, at least none who are not admitting it, um, or non-biology majors. So, but again, you know, I can go back and check on these things as well. Okay, so <clears throat> people have, um, again, asked me about how I do my grading. This should not be new for, again, anyone who had my course last term. Um, I set the top score to 100% because my exams are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, and again, ask people who took my class last term about that. Um, so I set the top score to 100%, and then I just scale from there, um, percentage-wise. Um, this gives a pretty straightforward breakdown. Um, I think it's reasonably generous in terms of the scores, but um, again, um, this is the main reason I have this here, is so you always go back to the first lecture and find it there. Uh, what are my exam policies? They're all closed book. There's no time limit on exams. I don't know if there's another class in here after hours. Um, if there isn't, then you can stay as long as you like. Um, if you do need more time, there's actually decent space outside here. We can just move outside when that's done. Um, however, since I allow you to take your exams home with you, uh, once somebody has left, I can't allow somebody to start after that. Um, so please get here on time on exam days. If you have accommodations at DRC, um, contact me and remind me, please, before exams, um, what you're planning on doing. Whether you're planning on taking it here, testing center, somewhere else, if we need to organize another place to do that, um, let me know. And the sooner we do that, the better. Uh, makeups, life happens. Um, hopefully not on exam days. Uh, but these are just got really under extreme circumstances because um, you see all of the TA and grading help I have. They're all standing up here with me right now. Um, so any extra exam is going to have to be completely extra, and I'm going to have to deal with that myself as well. So um, I do those as essay exams, um, as makeups, and I need some kind of evidence for that. Um, sometimes Scantrons get misscanned. Um, sometimes It'll be the wrong answer that was filled in, et cetera. Just let me know. I, I will photocopy, um, just literally scan in all of the Scantrons. And so if there's a problem between what you see on your Scantron sheet versus with a score that you see that I post on D2L, let me know. Um, and I will try and go ahead and, and change that. So how do you do well in this class? Um, basically, be prepared. Um, and that's probably true for pretty much all classes. Um, <clears throat> our textbook, which I didn't bring with us, um, Fundamentals of Molecular Biology, Virology, excuse me. Um, it's the second edition. The first edition is OK. Um, it's missing a couple of chapters. And I've tried to scan those extra chapters and post them on D2L. So if you just have the first edition, um, it's OK. Um, one of the things that I like about this textbook is that they have um, really nice chapter overviews and key terms. So at the beginning of each chapter, um, basically a paragraph or so on the important aspects of those particular viruses. 
Um, I don't specifically go and look at those when I put my exam together, but they're really nice reviews. Um, also has um, a nice glossary and references. So if you want to know more, because everyone wants to know more about viruses, um, it's a great place to find a lot of these things. Uh, I, again, post all of my lecture notes on D2L, usually by about 10 o'clock at night, the night before lecture. I'm not always that good about it. If there's nothing posted, email me. It's quite possible I have my lecture together already and forgot to post it to D2L. So let me know that beforehand. Um, also, if it's not there or you want to be extra prepared and read ahead or look a little, ahead a little bit, all of my lecture notes from last year are there. They're going to be very similar to this year's with, again, some updates, but they're going to be extremely similar. So those will be there as well. Um, YouTube recordings from last year's lecture, and in fact, I think the last four or five years lecture are all on YouTube as well. Um, and ask me lots of questions. Uh, those of you, again, who've had me before um, know that I have a tendency to speak quite quickly and go over stuff rapidly. The best way to get me to slow down is to ask me a question. So um, please do that. What's on D2L? I think I've mentioned this a whole bunch. Uh, lecture notes is a syllabus, which we'll try and keep to. Not always going to be the best. Um, old exams, no better way to study for my exams than go and look at old exams. I try and put together new exams every year. Um, some of the questions end up being really similar, even though I haven't gone back and looked at them. Um, so it gives you an idea what kinds of questions I ask and <clears throat> the general sort of subject matter as well. Um, put some supplemental materials. There's also some extra readings that are there. Um, a discussion forum. I don't use it very much, except there's a section on questions and answers. And so if there's a question that comes up during your reading in class and you didn't want to ask it, um, please send me an email about it. Or you're going back and re-listening to the lectures on YouTube and you're like, hey, what did he say? Um, quite possible I misspoke. Um, so please just send me an email about that and I will post the answer to D2L so everybody can take a look at those. Um, I do look at the email on D2L, but nowhere near as frequently as my PDX email. So just send me PDX email. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, other ways to teach virology. One of those is, again, this sort of general mechanisms, replication, assembly, etc. cetera. Um, Flint, Principles of Virology, they're actually in the fourth edition right now, is a great reference as far as that's concerned. It's also two volumes and I think about 300 bucks. Um, so I decided not to use that particular textbook for this course. Um, the second edition I'll have on reserve in the library. Um, it's a really good reference text for animal viruses, but doesn't get into some of these other viruses infecting microbes anywhere near as much. And so it's another reason that I decided not to use that. Um, Fields Virology. This is basically the, the holy book of virology. I think it's running four volumes now. They're about this thick. Um, basically, everything you ever wanted to know, and most people do know about viruses once it gets into print, um, is in Fields Virology. Um, I have a couple of copies in my office, so if there's a particular version, that virus that you're really, really interested in, let me know and I can loan that to you. Um, it's a fast moving field. Journal Virology, Virology, Science and Nature um, often are publishing really fun stuff, some of which I will try and incorporate into the lecture as we move on. Um, I have my own private virus library um, in my office, um, that you know, big building with the books in it over on the other side of campus, um, that also has a pretty decent virology selection, particularly for some of the bacteriophages, so the bacterial viruses, if I haven't checked all of them out already and they've ended up in my library. Um, and then, uh, again, office hours, after class, and, and by arrangement. Um, there is a lot of material um, online for virology. One that I particularly wanted to point out is Vincent Racaniello's um, website, which is a blog about new stuff that's happening in virology. Um, also, his is the inspiration for me recording all of my lectures. He records all of his lectures for his course and puts them all online. Um, also has a Coursera course on virology. That, again, this is the other model course. This is covering replication as one unit, all the different viruses. The transcription unit, all the different viruses, et cetera. So I think it kind of complements what we do. 
Um, and today on my way, in fact, over from my office to here, um, I was listening to the podcast This Week in Virology, also known as TWIV, which is also by Vincent Racaniello, um, where I think it's five or six now, I think they just expanded their group. Uh, virologists get together and discuss recent virology literature. Um, a lot of fun today. They were, well, today, the one I was listening to today, which I think was two weeks ago, um, was talking about papers where they were looking at the evolution of myxoma virus, which is a pox virus that people tried to use to kill off all of the rabbits in Australia and did a really good job except for a few rabbits, which then evolved to deal with the virus. And now the virus is evolving as well. So really fascinating kind of structure. And they now with genomics, they've been able to study the genomics of the rabbits and see how the rabbits have now evolved to be resistant to these various different viruses. Fascinating story. Um, so um, great place to go and sort of you know, geek out about interesting viruses. Um, one thing, and again, the lights are down here. Many virus um, extracellular structures have icosahedral symmetry to them, um, which is a fascinating geometry. Uh, but there's a really nice server um, through the Scripps Research Institute where you can actually make your own of these things, print out um, various versions. And I have one of the paper ones up here. Um, I find that's by far and away the best way to think about how these virus structures are put together. Um, if you have your own 3D printer, that's great, um, but also just the paper models that you can put together through this um, ViperDB um, structure. Um, we'll get to edge of life the movie .com a little bit later on. Um, viral zone, this is, again, a really nice complement to our textbook. Each of the different virus families on viral zone has an overview of that particular virus family's replication, transcription, assembly, et cetera. So nice comparisons between what we're talking about here. You can also go there and find a lot of that information. And then particularly in terms of bacteriophage, um, there was a birthday party for bacteriophage a couple of years ago now. Um, bacteriophage were originally described in 1915. And so in 2015, they had a big phage birthday party in San Diego um, with a number of talks, um, including by yours truly, where people have discussed sort of the latest results in bacteriophage. And that's you know, missing from even our textbook in terms of some of the latest stuff which is there. Um, I don't want to skip uh, everybody being happy and safe. Unfortunately, this class last year when we were teaching in this room, about halfway through the term, somebody drove their truck onto um, the sidewalk just down the road. So um, life does happen. If you have any kinds of issues, um, A, talk to me. These are the places you can find help on campus, Office of Public Safety, um, SHAC, Dean of Student Life, um, DRC, and any kind of, of mental health crises. So um, this is important stuff. Um, anything comes up, please let me know um, ASAP. But if I'm not around, um, there are other resources that are available to you. More exciting, um, you're not going to have to listen to me for every single lecture this term. Um, a couple of guest lectures, um, in fact, starting already on Friday. Um, postdoc in my lab, Nacho, as we call him, Dr. Nacho, um, who is a real expert on virus structure and virus evolution. We're we'll talking about virus structure. I'll actually be giving a pitch for my company um, over in Stott Center on Friday. Um, then Alec Hirsch, who's at OHSU VGTI, I'll be talking about flaviviruses. Um, things like dengue, Zika virus, yellow fever virus, et cetera. Um, he's one of the world experts on those. Um, if I can get Ryan Estep to come and talk, um, he's now working on herpes viruses also at OHSU. Um, he's actually a PSU grad um, who's gone on to do really cool stuff with herpes viruses. And then um, George Kaysen, who's a PhD student in my lab, he's been working on single-stranded DNA viruses, um, particularly the what we call the Cruci viruses. Um, also, that's what Nacho is working on as well. Um, another thing that I do in this class that people are not that wild about, but um, see, one person here knows a little bit about um, why I do this. I heard about random roll call. You guys know what random roll call is? So when I ask a rhetorical question, instead of waiting for people to put up their hands, I have a list of all of you. And I just go down that list and pick one out and um, ask you to answer the question. 
Um, you may pass, but if you pass, I will come back to you. Um, or you can also um, do something that uh, one of my other students recommends it's called the grenade approach. So um, I ask you a question, but you're not real happy about it. You can then ask your neighbors. But you only get two of those a term. Okay, I will start doing those next week as well. Um, again, we'll talk about some really cool stuff from my totally biased point of view, because they're viruses that we work on in my lab. Um, these Cruci viruses, SSVs and STIV, and then viruses that other people care about, um, Ebola and Zika. And there, uh, how many of you know that there's still a major Ebola outbreak happening? in Central Africa. Um, so um, everyone says, oh, it's, it's all gone. It's, there's nothing to worry about. No, that's not true at all. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So any questions about how the class is going to run? Or not, as the case may be. OK, we're all happy. How many of you went to D2L already? Good, found all the stuff? Good, OK. So um, should be pretty straightforward there. So. <clears throat> The rest of today, next half hour or so, a um, little bit of an outline in terms of just really big, big, big picture about what viruses are and why I don't actually agree with most virus definitions. And I'll tell you what my favorite virus definitions are. Um, major take home message from that is viruses and virions are not the same. Um, the virion is just the extracellular part of the virus. Um, and viruses are all about a life cycle, thinking about them. Um, why should we study viruses? Um, not because they make people sick, but because they're everywhere and they're incredibly diverse, um, much more so than the, the sickness aspects of things. And we'll talk a little bit about the history of virology, depends on where we get to here, um, how they originally discovered, and in fact, one of the very, very first aspects about virus, actually even before people knew about viruses being the definition of viruses were vaccines. Um, and in fact, vaccination happened before <clears throat> people even knew about viruses in and of themselves. Uh, not surprisingly, the reason that people started to think about viruses actually was pathogenesis. Originally, plant viruses actually um, were the first ones to be discovered. Um, and how those were discovered, and as I mentioned, for <clears throat> the case of bacteriophage, Bacteriophages, uh, by the way, I should have mentioned this earlier, these are viruses which are infecting bacteria. And the classic example of these is you know, bacteriophage T4, you know, our friendly giant microbe here. Uh, <clears throat> but these are by far and away the most common viruses that are present on our planet. And as we'll see, there are ridiculous numbers of these kinds of viruses there as well. We may get a chance to talk about virus detection and replication, but given that we've only got about a half hour now to go, we may or may not get there. So what's a virion? Um, and again, this is the extracellular part of the virus life cycle that we'll get back to in just a second. Um, some of the terminology here, we have um, two flavors of viruses, as I like to call them, two really major different kinds of, and again, I'm talking about viruses already. I do this as well. I'm mixing up viruses and virions. Virions, extracellular part of the virus. So you either have the naked forms of the virion, and that's like this one here, um, where you have just protein and nucleic acid. So proteins, these are our little orange blobs here. And the textbook is nice. It actually tries to keep you know, orange um, as far as the proteins and black as far as genomes. So here, um, orange proteins, and then the black is your genome. So this is also talked about in terms of a capsid. And so the capsid is going to be the proteins that are involved in interacting with the nucleic acid and protecting that nucleic acid. You've got the naked particles. You also have the enveloped particles. And the only real big difference between these guys is that you have a lipid envelope around the outside. You still have proteins that are associated with your nucleic acid, but then you also have this envelope on the outside. And both of these are virions. And they always have nucleic acid on the inside, and so that differentiates virions from those you know, non-nucleic acid, the prions, um, which are also 
infective, but they don't have nucleic acid that's associated with them. You also have viroids, which are just nucleic acid and no protein associated with it. We're just going to talk about the nucleic acid plus the protein, and that is going to be your virion. One of my favorite basic definitions that I love to use when I'm at OMSI talking to five to seven year olds is there a bag of nucleic acid. That bag is a very specialized bag, but that's basically all that the virion is, is a bag of nucleic acid. Um, Sir Peter Medawar, um, pioneering immunologist and virologist, calls it bad news wrapped up in a protein coat. So those are you know, some ways of, of thinking about these. But these are virions. And so why do I spend so much time talking about this? Well, this is partly because um, one of my good friends, a uh, woman named Patrick Voltaire, um, says, you know, ceci n'est pas un virus, which of course is a reference to Lenny Magritte, which is ceci n'est pas un pipe. Um, but the take home message here is that this is not a virus in and of itself. It's just the extracellular part. And this extracellular part itself, um, one of the analogies I like to use is saying, okay, it's like calling an oak tree an acorn. Now, yes, okay, you've got acorns, but there's a whole other process that gets to the rest of the oak tree. And so what's, what's the oak tree? Is the acorn the oak tree or is the oak tree a part of the acorn? And so this is, this is only part of that, that whole process. So <clears throat> let's talk about standard definitions. Standard definitions of viruses are a very small, and everyone who was in molecular last term knows that as soon as I put anything in quotes, it means I don't get it. I don't take it <clears throat> as being true, so we'll see the giant viruses later on in the class. Uh, infectious obligate intracellular parasite. Um, infectious obligate intracellular, that's pretty good. I like, I like those three words, infectious obligate intracellular. But parasite, as we'll see also later on in the course, that's not always really true. Um, sometimes these are replicating as parasites. I like to think of them much more as symbionts, and so they can go all the way from mutualism to parasitism. But be that as it may, these viruses need precursors of some way, shape, or form. These could be nucleic acid precursors. They could be amino acid precursors. Um, and one of my undergraduates who was working with the game had this wonderful analogy that said, you know, basically the, <clears throat> the, the, the virus genome is kind of like a recipe. And then it needs to go into a kitchen and get some chefs and all of the ingredients in order to make more virus. So precursors, um, that all viruses need some kind of precursors and none of them are making their own. They don't actually undergo metabolism by themselves. They need energy, some source thereof, and again, they're not undergoing metabolism by themselves as a virion. And when we talk a little bit later about that whole virus process, maybe it will change a little bit. All viruses to date that we have found need cellular translation. No virus so far has encoded a ribosome. So all viruses need host ribosomes. Uh, that, of course, could change if we find viruses that have a, oh, their own ribosomes, but then the question becomes, what's a virus and what's a cell? And so that starts to be a bit of an issue. And then this need membranes. This is actually straight out of our textbook. Um, needing the membranes if you are a enveloped virion or virus and enveloped virion, then that envelope is almost always picked up from cellular membranes. Um, it, they don't make their own membranes, although as we'll see later, some of these actually do, <coughs> excuse me, modify some of those membranes. The virion itself, um, this is part of the replication process. Once you have an infection, so uh, virion comes in, interacts with a host cell, the genome comes out. This virion is never reused. And so it's not like when you have cellular replication, where you have half of your cell divides and half of it goes one way and half of it goes the other way. Um, each time you divide, you're going to be using a little bit of that own original material. That's not true for the, is the way that viruses are going to replicate. They have their extracellular form, and then that 
usually actually degrades or is discarded, and a whole new set of extracellular forms and genomes are made before you have another round of virion production. So they're not replicating through binary fission, and you know, viruses have a DNA or an RNA genome. We're not going to talk about these viruses this term, but there actually are some virions which package both DNA and RNA in their virions. And um, as George will talk about later on in the term, we have some examples of viruses that probably arose through recombination between DNA and RNA viruses themselves. So there may be some, you know, this or RNA genomes. Most of them would have a DNA or an RNA genome. Now, the, vi the virus definition that I actually like the best is not the one from our textbook or most of the other textbooks. This is actually from Salvador Luria's textbook from 1953. I think it was 53, um, which is <clears throat> as follows. Viruses are entities whose genomes are elements of nucleic acid that replicate inside living cells using the cellular synthetic machinery and causing the synthesis of specialized elements that can transfer the viral genome to other cells. So this is 78, but his original one, I think, was in 53. Um, so <clears throat> nucleic acid genomes replicating inside living cells using the cellular machinery. And as we'll see, the sort of the bigger the virus you get, the less and less of the cellular machinery it's using. But they're always making these virions on the outsides of the cells. So another way of thinking about this is this is really your virus. Viruses have these virions, let's see, <clears throat> up at the very top here. Um, the virion is produced in D. That virion will go over to position A and insert its genome inside a cell. Once that nucleic acid part of the genome gets inside the cell, it will replicate, make more of its genome, make more virions. Those virions escape. And this whole process, I would say, this is the virus life cycle. And so you can talk about the virion as being the virus. It's only part of that whole cycle. And so one of the things uh, about this, and my friend Patrick Fortier also talked about this as well, is you really have two kinds of organisms as far as he, he's concerned. There are the ribosome encoding organisms. And all the ribosome encoding organisms are going to be those which are having the ribosomes. And I mentioned before, no viruses have their own ribosomes. So all of the ribosome encoding organisms are going to be cellular organisms. And then you have capsids, which are very specific for the viruses. Um, and he calls these capsid encoding organisms. And you can use his abbreviations. You have REOs, so the ribosome encoding organisms, and the CEOs, the capsid encoding organisms. And some people might say that CEOs like to replicate like viruses do. But that's a different story for a different section. So <clears throat> why do I study viruses? Um, not for the reason that most people study viruses. Um, viruses are absolutely everywhere. And I'll talk about why uh, we know that a little bit later on. Most people don't know this. Uh, viruses infect absolutely every cell that we found. In fact, I was just reading a really interesting paper about mitoviruses. Mitoviruses infect mitochondria. It's like, wait a minute. You've got viruses infecting mitochondria inside other cells? But yes, there are, there are mitoviruses. There are viruses which are infecting mitochondria. So they really do um, infect everything. Viruses are incredibly diverse, um, both in terms of their virions, but also in terms of their genomes. Um, a lot of what we call bacteria, oh, sorry, um, genomic dark matter, so things that have no similarity to other sequences whatsoever, turn out to be um, present in viruses. And viruses are also really, really great tools for understanding those ribosome encoding organisms, which they've basically taken over in order to make more of the virions and more of the virus genomes. So a lot of what we know about molecular biology, immunology, et cetera, has to do with the study of viruses. And that's actually the reason I started working on viruses, because I wouldn't understand the cells that they were infecting. Um, and it turns out the viruses are so fascinating, I've ended up spending much more time working on those. Um, now, yes, 
Viruses also make people sick, um, and that's another reason to study them. And these are my two favorite vir viral vectors we have to throw out here a little bit. Um, a few years ago now, um, carefully you know, covering so that they're not you know, moving all these viruses around. But yeah, great way of spreading viral disease. Um, it's my, one of my students used to call them fomites with feet. Um, ways for getting transmission around here. But not just um, <clears throat> bipedal organisms. Um, viruses really do infect all known organisms. So hopefully, um, this big tree here, um, <clears throat> Norm Pace um, just finished The Tangled Tree. Anybody read The Tangled Tree, David Quammen? Um, really great book talking about um, the tree of life and thinking about how organisms are related to each other. And, Take a message from that is he doesn't like this tree at all. <laughs> um, but this is a tree of cellular organisms and how they're all related to each other based on ribosomal sequences. And you know, just by that immediate definition, the fact that you're looking at ribosomal sequences means it doesn't include the viruses, but includes almost all of the cells. So we've got bacteria up here, archaea here, eukarya down here. And um, for reference, you know, we are here. Um, this is actually represents all of the molecular diversity present in all animals, um, which is here. But all of these other organisms, um, here represented by their small subunit RNA sequence, have viruses that are associated with them. Um, and for the most part, they've not been studied at all or very, very understudied. Um, I had another image, which I didn't show here, but sort of as the uh, relative size of the arrows here in terms of number of viruses that have been studied. You know, the number of viruses that have been studied in animals is about 95% of all viruses that people have studied. The other 5% are almost all those that infect E. coli, which is one particular kind of bacterium. But there are massive numbers of viruses that are infecting all of these different kinds of things. Between 10 and 40% of our genome is viral. Depends on how you define it. And we'll look at that a little bit long, um, later on. Viruses, and particularly some of the virion types, seem to be incredibly old. And so how do we know that? Partly from this virus, STIV, that I discovered. Um, but it turns out that viruses with this shape, um, you actually find in all three of the big divisions of life, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. Um, and if you think about this from an evolutionary point of view, you could sort of guess, and again, in terms of a time machine, we're not going to know this, that some virus types, I think a lot like this one, um, are probably extremely old. And in fact, when we had a common ancestor of all cellular life, which may or may not have been um, where you had differentiation between archaea, bacteria, and eukarya, um, probably had viruses that were infecting these organisms. Maybe even pre-cellular organisms had viruses that are associated with them. So, Viruses have been around for a really, really, really long time. We also know that viruses are absolutely critical from an evolutionary point of view. Um, if we didn't have viruses, then a lot of what we know about life today would not be the way that it is. Um, one really obvious way is that there's clearly selection going on. If you have a virus that makes an organism sick and an organism that doesn't want to get sick, you're going to have an evolutionary arms race. Um, and this has been extremely well documented. But even in terms of some of the bigger jumps in evolution, and that gets back to this tree, and in fact, David Quammen's um, book on the, the tangled tree, is how do you get major evolutionary changes? Well, major evolutionary changes are often coming from some kind of external genetic element. Well, what do viruses do? They move genetic elements around. And they're probably very, very important um, in that whole process. So, Mentioned many times, and we can talk about this more before, but <clears throat> that viruses are absolutely everywhere, um, incredibly ubiquitous. This is a sample of seawater. This could also just as easily be a sample of soil, or for that matter, the air in this room, if you concentrated it enough. What you see in this seawater sample, which has now been stayed with a nucleic acid binding stain, is you have, in this particular example, one poor little eukaryote. This is a diatom right here. And you have a few bacteria and archaea, which are these big dots right here. What are the little dots? Virions. Um, so lots and lots and lots of virions. And you can actually add up 
all these little dots in a particular sample of seawater, of soil, of air, and you get to absolutely ridiculous numbers. Um, the best numbers are actually from looking in ocean surface waters. There's between a million and 10 million virions per milliliter in ocean surface waters. That's a lot. That's a very, very, very large number. And if you think about the number of milliliters in an ocean and multiply it, there's a lot of you know, questions about you know, whether every milliliter in the ocean actually has that number of viruses. But actually, it's been pretty good, even when people have been looking at deep sea um, samples here. You get to an absolutely ridiculous number, um, 10 to the 31, um, which is uh, just kind of mind-blowing. Um, if you lined up all of these virus particles end to end, it would be about 100 million light years, which is just crazy. And when some people think about this, there's more, there are more virions in a cup of seawater than there are humans on the planet. Um, just absolutely crazy. And one way that you can sort of see this is, um, this is actually this is my thumb up there at the top. And this is a <clears throat> tube where we actually prepared some virions in it. Guesses. Any guesses on how many there are in there? Somebody who hasn't downloaded the notes yet. Guesses? Anybody want to guess? I don't have my random, I don't have my roll call list, so I can't, I can't ask you to all guess. 10 billion? 10 to the 11th, actually. So, you know, billion is 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 11th. So, <clears throat> 100 billion viruses in that tube. Virions, I should say. See, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm doing this again. Um, <laughs> correct me every time. Virions, Stedman, virions. So you know, that, they're, they're very, very small. Of course, you can't see them. But we know that they're that many. And I'll show you eh, probably on Wednesday um, how I actually know. And in fact, I, I got this number here. So in this case, it's um, 10 to the 10 PFUs per mil platforming units per mil, and there are about 10 milliliters that are in there. We'll talk about platforming units a little bit later on. I mentioned that the human genome is between 10 to 40 percent viral. <clears throat> um, the really obvious part of the human genome, this is one of the surprises um, when the human genome was sequenced, is that about 8 percent of the human genome is really clearly viral derived. And so if you look at sequences in the human genome, that are very similar to retrovirus-like sequences, it's 8% of the human genome. That's a really, really, really large amount of the genome. Um, some people argue, and a lot of us virologists argue about this a lot as well, is whether the large repeated elements that are present in the genome, the long interspersed nuclear elements and the short interspersed nuclear elements, are derived from, <clears throat> excuse me, these retroviruses. Some people say retroviruses are derived from these retro elements, but they're still really similar to each other. And yeah, it's about 40% of the genome if you add the clearly retroviral-like and these lines and signs relative to the 1.5% of the genome, which is encoding unique protein sequences. So we're actually more viral than we are human at least in terms of our genomes, which is also a little surprising. Uh, but I think really fascinating in terms of, of thinking about, and this is just the human genome, let alone all of the other genomes that people have looked at. And it turns out that most eukaryotic genomes are actually, the larger ones anyway, are pretty similar to this. They've got lots and lots of viral elements in them and lots and lots of transposons that are present in the genomes, and relatively small amounts of protein coding, unique protein coding sequences present in their genomes. But even if you just look in viral genomes, you have huge amounts of diversity. And this is a, just a couple of papers um, that <clears throat> people have published in the last few years. Um, if you just look at a viral genome, and you know, we're in this, the age of genomics now, um, and in fact, the very first complete genome sequence to be sequenced was a viral genome. We'll talk about that viral genome later on. Really small genome. Um, but <clears throat> one of the things that lots of people have done in the last few years, there's been a huge amount of work, something called the CFAGES program, 
a professor by the name of Graham Hatful out of the University of Pittsburgh, has done a fabulous job of getting high school students, undergraduate students, we actually thought about starting this program here, um, sequencing their own new mycobacteriophage, and so it's a mycobacterium virus. Um, turns out that you can just go and look at any soil sample. You'll find new viruses in them. You can sequence those viruses. And it turns out about 50% of the sequences in any of those virus genomes don't match anything in databases. It's gotten a little better now because a lot more of these sequences have been done. It's now about 30% of the sequences that you find in these genomes don't match anything in any other genome that anybody's seen before. If you look at some of those little dots that we had on that uh, nucleic acid stain of seawater and sequence all of those, 90% of those sequences don't match sequences that are in other databases. Um, this has changed a little bit in the last 13 years, but it's still about 80% of these sequences that don't really obviously match anything. Um, if you look at some of the extremophile viruses, like the ones that we work on, um, like this guy and some of the other ones that we'll talk about right at the end of the term, 95% uh, of the genes in these genomes don't match anything else. Maybe they match the other genomes of these other extremophile viruses. We have no idea what most of these things are doing. So <clears throat> people have done, again, some back-of-the-envelope calculations, um, saying that there are billions of unique genes, maybe only millions of unique genes um, in some of the newer estimates, but still very, very, very undersampled in terms of all the genetic material which is present. One of my buddies, Matt Sullivan, um, published a paper two years ago, a rather controversial one, where he says that actually, well, maybe some of these numbers are a little bit too high, and he thinks there's only 15,000 of them. But be that as it may, even if there are only 15,000 sequences of these surface viruses, they're still incredibly diverse. And one of the experiments that we did a couple of years ago is we went to a place called Boiling Springs Lake in the Lassen Volcanic National Park. You'll learn more about this when George Kaysen gives his guest lecture. Um, this is what I like to call the largest hot spring in the world that nobody has ever heard of or very few people. Right off the Pacific Crest Trail, it's a lake, probably about 10 times as big as this room. The low temperature is 50 degrees Celsius year round. Um, the high temperature is about 96 degrees and it's a pH of two. None of my students wanted to go out there and collect samples for me. They didn't go to want to go for a swim. Go figure. It's only 50 degrees. You only die of, you know, third degree burns after about five minutes in it. Why not? Yeah, well, do you want to get your degree or not? Come on. Um, so <clears throat> that being said, one of the things that we did is we collected all of the nucleic acid from those little dots. So lots of little dots are present in there. We get rid of the big dots, all the bacteria, archaea, eukarya. Um, and just sequence those dots. And one of the things that we found were 93% of the sequences in there had no similarity whatsoever to anything else. About 7% did. Um, and my graduate student, Jeff Diemer, um, said this looks a lot like the universe because the universe has a lot of dark energy and dark matter and only about 4% is visual. So we could call this the, the dark matter of sequence space or all of these viral sequences. Um, that we really don't know what most of them are doing. So it's, I like to think of this as a huge opportunity um, to try and learn about what a lot of these things are doing. Um, and there's going to be a lot to do and a lot to go around for quite a long time. So viruses are incredibly abundant, incredibly diverse in terms of their sequences, but they also have these really unique shapes. So here are just a couple of those unique shapes. Um, this one is dengue virus, a flavivirus. Most virions, and I think Nacho will talk about this before, have an icosahedral symmetry to them. And that actually makes a lot of sense if you think about simplicity and how you have a simple structure. But that's by no means the only kinds of structures you have. I talked about podcast I was listening to this morning, uh, myxoma viruses, these are pox viruses. The virions here, um, people call these a brick sort of shape, but again, rather different. Uh, again, many viruses have these icosahedrally symmetric shapes. This particular one is really fascinating because it's the structure of the virion actually changes under different conditions. 
So under, remember correctly, high pH conditions, it looks like this. and low pH conditions, it looks like that. It opens up. And that opening is actually probably really important for releasing the virus genome to get it to the outside of the cell. Poliovirus, um, almost eliminated. I think we're down to under 100 natural polio cases a year um, on the planet, which is really amazing. And we'll talk more about poliovirus's um, later on when we talk about the pico, pico RNA viruses. Tobacco mosaic virus, the very first virus ever to be isolated, has these long rods. And then probably the most fascinating, remember those little dots? So that was just you know, nucleic acid stain. If you now go to the electron microscope, you see there's a whole variety of different shapes that you get of these kinds of virions that you find. And this particular one is a saline wetland, but those oceanic sequences as well, you see lots of these as well. So this is just a little bit of those shapes. Again, most of them are going to have icosahedra. Sometimes they'll have helices. Often they'll have icosahedra and helices connected to each other. But if you go to places like Boiling Springs Lake or some of the other hot spring environments, you see some really bizarre kinds of shapes. You see some of the virions that look pretty normal. Here's one with a nice icosahedral head and a tail on it. There are these really long filamentous viruses called the Cydianus filamentous virus that have these claws at the ends of their virions. These claws close on pili in terms of when they're about to do an infection process. So that closing allows them to bind to cells. The other thing about these Acidionis filamentous viruses, which is really amazing, is that this scale bar here is 100 nanometers. The poor cells that they infect are only about half this size. And so the virion is actually twice as long in length as the diameter of the cell. The poor infected cell here looks like a you know, you know, bowl of spaghetti that's just about to explode. It's really kind of crazy. Um, <clears throat> there are these nice icosahedral symmetric viruses, STIV, the one that I discovered. Um, we spend a lot of time with these lemon-shaped virions um, that are about 60 nanometers by 100 nanometers with a short tail on them, um, just bound a little bit of degree. And the favorite morphology that I have is this one. Um, a Cydianus bottle-shaped virus. So it really does kind of look like, the virion looks like a champagne bottle. Also has, you know, birthday candles up here at one end. How the heck you get something like that to form is still a really open and, and fascinating question in terms of thinking about virions. Unfortunately, it turns out that that one's really hard to work with, and this one's a lot easier to, and those of you who are taking the mutant viruses from Hell Lab this afternoon will actually get to study some of this and how it's being put together. So again, highly diverse in terms of structure, highly diverse in sequences, incredibly ubiquitous. Um, why do we want to study them other than the fact that they're just really, really cool? Again, Salvador Luria uh, basically, and I'm not going to read this whole thing here, but unifying and simplifying patterns. And so we're going to spend most of the rest of the term talking about some of the unifying and simplifying things. You could get into the nitty-gritty detail, but if you're going to be talking about, at the very minimum, 15,000 different virus species, we're not going to talk about 15,000 in the next you know, 10 weeks. We're just going to talk about some of the bigger picture kinds of things here. So um, overall patterns. Um, and unifying and simplifying genera um, generalizations. I think I'll finish up just bringing up a couple of open questions that are still out there as far as viruses and virology. One really big one, where do viruses come from? How did viruses arise? Uh, I mentioned already that there's some, I think, good evidence, and we'll talk more about the evidence later, about viruses being really, really old. Uh, historically. So where did they come from? Some simulations of early life say that parasitic replicators probably arose about the same time as cellular life did. So maybe viruses and cells have been co-evolving since the origin of life, but that gets you to, well, how did life arise in the first place? Another question is, why are there viruses? If you think about a, and we talked about this from an evolutionary point of view, a virus is going to be requiring some kind of cellular host in order to be able to replicate. Well, if some cell could actually manage to escape from being infected by any virus, 
it might actually be a lot better off from an evolutionary point of view. So how have they not managed to undergo this evolution? Now it turns out that probably there are the vast majority of viruses and virus infections, probably a lot of the ones that are present in our genome, and we'll talk about that later on too, um, which might actually have a positive role. And one of my favorite messages, again, when I give talks at OMSI is viruses have a bad rap. Um, viruses are actually probably pretty good. Certainly viruses are good for some aspects of the planet and probably also for us as well. So lots of the viruses, some of the ones we'll talk about later, undergo a latency period where they basically are hanging out inside the host and not making virions, not killing off the cell, not taking too much of the nutrients. And again, evolutionarily speaking, um, they may actually be pretty, <clears throat> pretty good. Now, one thing, um, we've got about four or five minutes here. Um, I'm going to try and show um, this movie if I can. Um, some of you may have seen this already. This is a <clears throat> trailer that I was putting together a few years ago. Oh, I guess uh, we don't have the, uh, the whole sound here. That, of course, should be virion, not virus. should be really interested in viruses is that at least on this planet there are more viruses 10 to 100 times more viruses than there are of anything else which is around. really is is what about humans in terms of our humans viruses lots of viruses that we know of actually change their environment change their host in particular and my favorite example is actually those viruses that infect some of the algae and the bacteria in the oceans that make the oxygen we breathe but you think about it from the human earth perspective Humans have clearly changed what's going on on Earth and changed it in such a way that it may actually be beneficial for the Earth and certainly beneficial for humans. And so you can think about all kinds of things that have happened on our planet which may actually be positive from an Earth point of view.
Hi, I'm Dr. Ken Stedman from Portland State University, the Center for Life and Extreme Environments. Okay, this is the last little bit here you can ignore. It's the film we're trying to make. Coming soon.